the renowned space artist and author Mike Carroll, and he'll present the introductions for this renowned cast of several here on the stage. So, Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> I'm going to stay sitting down um, just because I'm full of lunch. Welcome to uh, our discussion about space art. Uh, before I give some introductory remarks about um, uh, the genre, I want to just uh, very quickly introduce our panel members, I'm being quick for two reasons. First of all, I want to give them time to uh, speak for themselves, to give us a little window into their world. And each of the people here does art in a very different way. So it should be a, a very rich experience. And secondly, uh, because we have so many panel members. So this should be fun. It'll be a little like managing a rawhide cattle drive, but it should be fun. All right, next to me, uh, is Andy Chaikin, a uh, renowned author, uh, author of uh, Man on the Moon and also a passion for my, passion for my, my favorite books. Uh, Steve Hobbs, very talented artist from Australia. He gets the award for coming the furthest, I think, for the conference. Uh, George Butler, we were privileged to see Roving Mars the other night. Um, I uh, owe a lot to George because three times a week I go to a gym in Colorado and uh, there probably wouldn't be commercial gyms if it hadn't been for his earlier work. Uh, so uh, then we have uh, Jim Dean uh, who has been, uh, he's the founder of the uh, NASA arts program uh, and a very talented artist in his own right. Uh, does some spectacular uh, landscapes, and, and I know we'll see some of that. Bert Ulrich also, uh, same thing, very uh, talented artist, um, fun guy, and um, he, ha he is actually the curator of uh, the entire collection at NASA now. He's, he's also working in uh, other media. Uh, Emile Decou is uh, a um, musical person, and we'll be, we'll be seeing his... Uh, conducting of uh, the symphonies for, he's worked with um, uh, NASA and in fact did the music that celebrates the 50th anniversary of NASA and the 40th anniversary of Apollo 11. And then uh, finally Keith Keplinger has uh, done the uh, design for the posters of uh, the Mars Society uh, meeting this time around. Uh, does, uh, he, he brings expertise from a slightly different part of the industry, which will be interesting. So uh, let's get started. Uh, it should be, I, I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing all these diverse people. Um, space art uh, really is, it has a lot of, it comes in a lot of different forms. It's un, unlike other art movements uh, in history in that uh, it holds together not by any commonality of style or even medium, but rather by the subject matter it depicts. Uh, it ranges from planetary landscapes to very personal portraits of people donning spacesuits, uh, there's music, film, literature, all these things contribute to our vision of space through the arts. And people have been thinking about uh, depicting the cosmos for a very long time. They've been trying to do it. This is a, a cover from uh, Amazing Stories in 1948. Uh, it's a painting of Jupiter seen from Europa. Now, Jupiter looks pretty good, doesn't it? The clouds are, are, obviously this person did their homework in terms of, of what the planet looks like. Um, Europa is a bit more of a problem, as we know there are <laughs> a, not a whole lot of palm trees there. I was uh, in England at Bude last week and I was told that there were palm trees there too. It was a lie, it was very cold. So, but that's another story. Um, there have been golden ages of exploration, many uh, throughout history. Uh, the Chinese um, moved through uh, the known world in the uh, oh, 1400s or so uh, on massive treasure ships. Um, of course, there were the Vikings that came across and um, populated Iceland and discovered Greenland and the New World. Um, 
and uh, the exploration that's happened throughout history has had an effect on art, and art has had an effect on that exploration as well. Uh, I submitted for your approval is this image of a rhinoceros. What's this doing in a space art talk? Well, uh, Albrecht Dürer did this uh, drawing of a rhinoceros having never seen one. He had reports from Europeans who had visited North Africa. And they brought back descriptions and they brought back the horn and either the left ear or the tail, depending on which account you read, of uh, a rhinoceros. And so this was his reconstruction based on uh, the tales that these travelers brought back. Uh, there are some interesting parallels with the explorations uh, that the Europeans did as they moved across the North American continent. We'll see a little more of that in a moment. Um, mm -hmm. Albert Bierstadt, for example, um, did these beautiful paintings of the West, as did uh, Thomas Moran, other people who were painting really in the Hudson River School style, um, which has uh, many parallels to astronomical art. These people were going into a new frontier, and they were bringing back images of a place uh, to to people who lived on the East Coast and had never seen anything like it. Frederick Church uh, was um, a very rich man and he sponsored his own expeditions. He went, uh, he went uh, to the Arctic and Antarctic. This is a beautiful painting that he did. Again, pushing into new places and um, bringing back stories. We have explorers of a different kind today. Some of them wear spacesuits. Some of them uh, wear solar panels but they all send us back stories, and uh, the stories that they tell us inform our art and inspire us on many levels. Uh, and one story they're telling us is that there are a lot of places out there that look a lot like home. Uh, this is a place called Mars Hill in Death Valley, and this, of course, is, uh, I believe that's Utopia Planitia on Mars. Um, there are, the, the places, not simply morphologically similar. In other words, there are reasons that these two places look the same, and it's not just coincidence. So uh, here's, here's another one. Uh, this is a, a river in Madagascar, River Delta, same uh, scale on Mars, floodplain. These two things were formed in slightly different ways, but nevertheless, this, the shape, the morphology, is something that can inform us so that we artists can um, uh, depict these things a little more accurately. And so uh, the visual space artist goes out and paints outside, plain air, uh, just like the Impressionists did uh, back in the 1800s. We study the geology and the environment so that our paintings are more accurate scientifically and more convincing. We're going to talk about Mars and art because that's what we're all here for is Mars. But before we do that, I want to take a case in point. And we're going to use Titan, Saturn's big fuzzy moon. Titan has uh, more atmosphere than an Italian restaurant. But we didn't know that uh, all the time. In fact, early on, we knew that it was big. We knew that it was orange. But we didn't know how much air it had. It, we could tell that it had methane. But the big question when you're looking through a telescope is how much nitrogen there is. Because you can't see nitrogen through a telescope very well. The Earth is full of it. And so it kind of blocks it out. So in the days, in the 1950s, Chesley Bonestell did this beautiful painting of Titan. And it's a, it's a nice portrait of what science was thinking at this point in history. Uh, red rocks, which made sense because Titan's very red as a point of light. There's ice there because we knew it was cold, but it has this beautiful pristine blue sky because we thought it was a, maybe a thin air atmosphere. About uh, 25 years later, Ludwig Pasig did this painting for National Geographic. Uh, similar approach, science had not significantly changed. Then uh, Dave Hardy in, in England realized that if you've got a pure methane atmosphere, you might be shifting the, um, the color, the Rayleigh scattering in the, the, the uh, atmosphere toward the green. And so he did this painting, I love this painting, of miners on Titan that are blowing something up. I'm not sure why you would have young people on Titan. That's what I asked him, but that's what he said, miners on Titan. Oh. Uh, so, 
Sorry. <laughs> there aren't very many space jokes, guys, so bear with me. And there's one less than you think. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to sit down there?